Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. And, Wes, week one has finally arrived. Are you ready for this? I am. I, I know they can make a lot of jokes here about how long the offseason was and, you know, training camp and everything. But I, to me, this is almost more like the Christmas morning kind of thing, that it's like we know – how good this team can be. We've seen the potential and all these things. But when you have one of the youngest rosters in the National Football League, as much as you and I can pontificate about the various different possibilities of this team, you want to see it out on the football field. And what better way from the Green Bay Packers and the Jordan Love era to kick things off than going down to Soldier Field to play their longest rival? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I've done a little bit of research, and I'm going to be writing about this uh, later on in the week. This is actually the 25th time that the Packers and Bears will open a season against one another. I believe the current count is the Packers have the lead 13 wins, 10 losses, one tie. Um, some of those have been significant. Uh, you know, the Packers and Bears played the first game at Lambeau Field. The Packers and Bears were the first game of the Vince Lombardi era, the first game of the Mike McCarthy era. A lot of those, uh, and and uh, and the first game of the Matt Lafleur era, and now the first game of the Jordan Love era with him taking over for Aaron Rodgers. And now it'll be interesting because I, you know, there's there's going to be all of the all of the excitement, all the buildup, all of the nerves, and all that. But I think what one thing that I think will really work to Jordan Love's advantage in this situation on Sunday at Soldier Field is that he has actually started an NFL game before, and he did it on the road yep. at Arrowhead Stadium in a tough place to play. So as much as there is so much anticipation for this game and signaling the transition to the new era at starting quarterback, at least from Jordan Love's perspective, everything about going through the pregame and the preparation and knowing that you're going to go out there and play four quarters against an opponent with the crowd against you and all that kind of stuff, he's been through it before, and I think that that, uh, that is at least a, a little bit of something that he can hang his hat on as he, uh, as he makes uh, this momentous start. Yeah, I think it's a lot of bit of something, to be honest with you, because when you're a young quarterback that has been the understudy for Aaron Rodgers for three years uh, the opportunities to play were few and far between especially early on in 2020 when there was not a preseason but I thought that when you look at every step of Jordan Love's journey from the first preseason to that game against Kansas City the spot start in 21 playing a little bit against Detroit later that same season in the second half when the Packers already had their their seed wrapped up and then lastly, last year against Philadelphia, every single time I thought you saw progress from him, not just in the stat books, but in how he carried himself as a quarterback in the way in which he played the position. This is going to be a hostile environment because the Chicago Bears and their fans, they're going to be energized. As much as you and I, I think, have talked about you know expectations on the Detroit Lions this year as they've continued to make this progress underneath Dan Campbell – the Bears feel likewise. They feel like with Justin Fields, they have their quarterback of the future. They feel like they've drafted well. They've made the right signings. Are they going to be a team that's going to contend for a Super Bowl this year? I wouldn't think so. But they believe they should go into this game and be able to change the tide here in this rivalry against the Packers. And from the Packers' perspective, from Love's perspective, what better way to put your stamp on things than going back down into Soldier Field and continuing this winning streak that Matt LaFleur has been on. I'm sure he's not going to want to talk about it this week, <laughs> but eight tries against the Chicago Bears and eight victories so far. Green Bay has really controlled the tempo of this thing, and obviously now that's something that Jordan Love wants to continue to build upon. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about this Bears team a little bit because – it is the second year of the Matt Eberflus era yep. as the head coach. Luke Getze, the former Packers assistant coach as the offensive coordinator down there in Chicago working with Justin Fields. He is in his third year as the starting quarterback, which is the second year with this regime on the coaching staff. So there are a lot of a lot of hopes and aspirations for Justin Fields to make some major strides this year. Now, this is a young man, I believe he rushed for over 1,000 yards last year, which doesn't happen very often at the quarterback position. I think the, um, the word out of Chicago is that they would like Justin Fields to not have to run as much, to not, not maybe run as much as he did last year, to try to hang in the pocket and make more plays with his arm because he certainly does have the arm 
to do that. And one thing the Bears did to help him significantly in that regard is they went out and got DJ Moore, the wide yep. receiver from Carolina, who may not be a, a, a household name in terms of wide receivers, but you look at what he accomplished in five seasons at Carolina, over 5,000 receiving yards. Three of those years, he was over 1,100 receiving yards. This is the most accomplished offensive perimeter weapon that the Bears have to go with Justin Fields now, and it's going he's going to be a player to keep an eye on come Sunday. Well, and you can't really draw too much out of the preseason, right? But I thought some of the early signs that we saw, you know, the, the catch and run, the, the things that he's going to be able to do with the ball in his hands if you can get him free in space, I'm sure that's what they're going to be scheming up. I'm sure that's what Luke Getzey's going to be looking to achieve. But even the way they've built the rest of this roster out now, right? Mercedes Lewis ends up in Chicago. Robert Tunyon is in Chicago now. Cole Komet just got a you know extension, got rewarded. And they feel like he's going to be a big part of this thing too. I think the Bears have tried to figure out this offseason, okay, what does Justin Fields do well? Where can we help him? And in what areas can we take what he's already done well and improve upon that? Having a guy like Mercedes does that. Having, you know, an offensive line that I think is trying to make steps forward here and trying to galvanize itself is going to do that. But at the end of the day, the Bears needed receivers. And as good of a story as Darnell Mooney was, last year they just didn't really have a lot of guys that Fields could go to. So he did have to improvise a lot. You're right, Mike. Last year he ran for 1,100 yards. You know, he threw for 17 touchdowns. But at the end of the day, the Bears still were 3-14. and 14. It didn't translate to wins. Right. They needed to deepen out this roster on both sides of the ball. And I think when you see someone like Moore come in that has the amount of energy that he has, there's a feeling that this is one of those number one receivers that we've been missing and a guy that could potentially you know, kind of pick up for what they've lacked since Allen Robinson left. Yeah, and on in the backfield, the Bears have now seemingly have turned things over to Khalil Herbert as their number one running back, uh, David Montgomery. Uh, is gone he's now actually with division rival Detroit and uh, um, Herbert is a guy you know showed a lot of flashes broke some big plays Um, I don't have his uh, his exact statistics from from last year in front of me but this is a he's he's a guy packs a punch I guess is maybe the best way to describe his running style he's it's nothing that's overly dynamic but he's not exactly easy to bring down a lot no. of times. No, I mean, he's a little powerhouse. I mean, five foot nine, 210 pounds, whatever he goes at. Yeah, you were talking about last year with his stats. He ended up finishing with uh, 731 rushing yards, four okay. touchdowns. But the biggest thing of all for him was the four, 5.7 yards per clip on the attempts. That's one thing that I thought last year the Bears sort of saw is, okay, David Montgomery's been our guy for a few seasons, you know, but you go back to the, the, the way that this offense was built originally – it's that Matt Forte type back, right? And, and obviously Herbert is not Forte in terms of size, but a guy that could be an every down type of presence for you. I, I think that's probably where they wanted to get back to a little bit this offseason. Montgomery ends up with the Detroit Lions, and the Bears said, you know what? We like what we have in-house. We're going to continue to develop this guy. Now, what's always going to be interesting is I looked at the pairing of Fields and Montgomery almost as like a running back tandem, right? Yeah. You know, not so much thunder and lightning, but just different guys that can do different things with their ball in their hands. Herbert gets them back to probably more of just the between the tackles type runner. And I'm very curious to see how he can make, you know, Fields life a little bit easier too in that regard. But at the end of the day, it comes down to being healthy. And I think when you look at the Montgomery era in Chicago, that was one area where they just, they had to keep turning to different running backs because Montgomery got banged up. If Herbert can be the guy and stay on the field for him, like he has the past two seasons for the most part, you know, this is going to be someone that I think they feel like they can hang their hat on in this season and years to come. Yeah. Well, on the defensive side of the ball for the Bears, it's definitely been a, I guess you'd almost say an ongoing transition over the last couple of years because the days of uh, that defensive front of, you know, Akeem Hicks and Khalil Mack and Robert Quinn and those guys, they're all gone. Yep. Um, and it's not a bunch of household names up front on the defensive line, but what catches your eye when you look at this Bears lineup on the defensive side is the three off the ball linebackers in this 4 3 because they have, they got TJ Edwards from the Philadelphia Eagles. They got Tremaine Edmonds from the Buffalo Bills. And then Jack Sanborn, who they developed. Yep. Um, at, he was a rookie last season. And, of course, I don't want my you know Wisconsin bias to shine through <laughs> too much here. But T.J. Edwards and Jack Sanborn, former Wisconsin Badgers, who uh, are, are making their way here in the NFL. And then you plug in a former 
you know, very high draft pick in Tremaine Edmonds coming out of, coming out of Buffalo. That's the uh, that sort of is seems to be what the, the the core of the Bears defense is going to be now. Not to say that they're completely hearkening back to you know the Brian Urlacher, Lance Briggs days of of those off the ball linebackers, but in some senses that's that's going to be the uh, um, you know where where the targets are when you try to go after the Chicago Bears defense. Yeah, and I felt like you know in last year they did everything right. You know they made trades, they kind of cleared house a little bit, and you know Sanborn sort of fell into that void sort of came out of nowhere although I think there was a lot of people when they signed him as a UFA and saw him early on thought that this guy could actually be a player for us but Edmonds is a guy I really like because I feel like you always have to have an athletic rangy type of linebacker that that can do all the grunt work but also can drop back into coverage and I thought TJ Edwards is a great compliment to that as well in a lot of ways you hope for the Bears you know I'm sure the Bears are hoping it's more successful than what they did about what was that five six years ago when they completely overhauled their linebacker situation when they signed Danny Trevathan when they signed I think it was Jarrell Freeman and that inside backer dude just didn't quite get them to where they needed to be yeah you know this to these two guys a little bit more athletic I think a little bit younger in, in kind of looking to see what they have in front of them, but they need that to be the nucleus because I don't know right now what, what that defensive front gives them in terms of pressuring the quarterback. That is probably the biggest area they've transitioned here. A lot of those household names that they had for so many years up front that you could count on for, you know, 10, 15 sacks. They're not there now. You know, there's no Khalil Mack, the Akeem Hicks of the world in his prime, like those type of players set the tone for that entire unit. Right. That's going to be one of the big transitions, but they still do have veterans too, though. I mean, you look at the back end, Eddie Jackson is still doing his thing back there. They have depth, but it's now just going to be a question of where, what does that pass rush offer and behind it, how do they handle opposing offenses? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, when you look at Matt, Eber, Matt Eberflus's background coming from uh, coaching the defense in Indianapolis and now transitioning to the head coach, the defenses with the Indianapolis Colts were were nothing flashy. They yeah. were, they didn't put up a whole bunch of great numbers or you know anything you know a whole bunch of big time highlights or anything, but they were defenses that were that were just sound that were difficult to solve at times because they didn't have any you know big weak spots that, that that stood out to you. That's what Matt Eberflus is trying to build. That's why he's trying to build the the middle of that defense with those linebackers as um, as the core of things and uh, and we'll see how it uh, how it works out for them. Going into going into year two, what give me your sense of what you feel the atmosphere will be like at Soldier Field because there is so much anticipation for the for this Bears team. But yet, it only had three victories last year. I, you know, it's hard when we're not in Chicago every day to get a sense of okay, just how patient are Bears fans going to be with this new regime and and uh, and everything else. And and certainly starting off against the Packers, it's a big time opportunity for the Bears to make a statement in Week One. Um, as you said earlier, coming off of you know kind of three decades of dominance by Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers uh, as Packers quarterbacks, and even different from that, Mike, three decades with a few exceptions of the pressure always being on Green Bay heading into that atmosphere. I, I think the pressure and and the, the the pendulum kind of swings back to the Bears now. I think they're favored in this game at the time in which they're taping this, and to me. It's funny, I, I feel like I'm almost echoing myself when you and I talked about this game last year in that it's all Justin Fields. Yeah, everything that the Bears have, all their hopes are hanging on that young quarterback. Um, think about it. They, they, this was a great year to be going into the quarterback business. A lot of guys went off the board, a lot of teams moving up to get guys, a lot of equity being traded around uh, trying to find the next franchise guy. The Bears fell into that number one spot, and they said, you know what, we're good. We got our guy. We're excited about this dude. And here they are now kind of going into another season, marching into another season. The, the part that always strikes me as interesting is we, it follows the same script. I don't know if it's media-driven. I don't know if it's just a response from coaches, but the script is always the same. When a young quarterback that is a scrambler, that's a runner, produces on the ground with his feet, the narrative always changes in year two and three, sometimes four, to, hey, can they throw more? Can they become more of a pocket passer? That's where the Chicago Bears are going to know better than you and I as far as what they feel like fields can be in the long run. Yeah. Because you do need to keep them healthy. You do need to keep them out there. 
But he also utilizes his feet in a way a lot of quarterbacks haven't been able to. Uh, I don't take it as just a flight or flight mechanism with him. I look at it as he is a legitimate running threat, running back threat. And I don't think, I think there's been a dearth of those in the league. There's been guys who can run like Patrick Mahomes that are natural passers. And there's been guys that they just run for the sake of running because they're getting out of their progressions. Fields went through his progressions, but a lot of times it kind of went to him having to scramble to make plays with his feet last year. With more weapons this season, when you ask me the expectations, what the atmosphere is going to be like, I think this one's going to be really electric for the Bears' standpoint, but I think it's also predicated on them being able to keep some wins going the first month of the season to keep that energy flowing in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll take care of a little bit of sponsor business here. West Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7. 365 and at cousin subs we have something for everyone like our wisconsin cheese curds mac and cheese golden fries and creamy shakes all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl cousin subs 50 years of better all right so as much as the the spotlight in this game is on jordan love making his first start as the heir apparent to aaron Rodgers. There are a lot of guys we talked about in our last couple of shows about how young this Packers roster is. A lot of a lot of Green Bay Packers will be making their NFL debuts. There are a whole bunch of rookies on this yep. roster now. We don't know who all necessarily is uh, you know going to play, but um, but you talk about a way to sort of shake off those first NFL jitters. Throw yourself into a Packers Bears game in uh, in week one of your rookie season and here we go this reminds me of the old don hodkowitz go learn how to ride a bike theory <laughs> which was okay we can do the training wheel thing or i can just get you in the front yard and start taking some tumbles and figure it out right that's probably what this is going to be like for green bay they're, they're going to take some bumps early on jordan love is going to take some bumps early on but what i've been saying and you've had to edit it when i've written it in insider inbox congratulations to you, is the Packers have veteran depth where it counts, right? If you're going to pick, okay, you're going to have rookies here, you're going to have veterans here. Mike, where do you want to make sure you have veteran help? You want to have it on the blind side of your quarterback. The Packers have that in David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins. They have guys in the backfield that know what they're doing and blitz, you know, blitz protection and being able to be a check down option in Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. Where they're young is the position where sometimes you want to be young, right? You want to have young receivers like Jaden Reed come into your offense. A guy I like Malik Heath, who's probably going to see some snaps right out of the gate, even though he was an undrafted rookie. And someone like Luke Musgrave, who will be learning on the job this year as a tight end one. But I'll tell you what, Mike, for being a rookie, he really impressed me in camp in terms of what he was able to do out of the gate at a very complicated position. This is going to be a supreme challenge for this football team. They're going to have to hang their hat at times on their defense. and They're going to need the defense to play to that standard. But that being said, as you, myself, Larry McCarron, we've all talked about, the Packers team, assuming they can stay healthy, that takes the field at Soldier Field in week one is not going to look anything like the last one in week 18 when the, when the Bears come to Green Bay to play the Packers. Right. It is going to be developed. It is going to be matured. And you just hope through the course of that season, those 18 weeks, those 17 games, you can pick up enough wins along the way that keeps you in the hunt for playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. And the Packers are young as well. Obviously, at the specialist position, you have the rookie kicker in Anders Carlson, sixth-round pick out of Auburn. He'll make his NFL debut. And then Daniel Whelan at punter, he's taking over there for the veteran Pat O'Donnell. And I use that as a transition because I have to clarify something, and I'll do it right here on the show because it was on our last show that I made a comment in talking about Daniel Whelan and in trying to tease the feature story that I wrote on him that uh, that is on our website. You can go find it if you'd still like to read it. But I made the passing comment that Daniel Whelan went to a small school in California. Okay. No, no, wait, wait, listen, right. listen, yep. listen, because... I, I, I took a couple days off this last weekend. I disconnected. I disappeared, quite frankly, for a couple of days. And then I came back and I read a defense of that line from the last unscripted show that you put in Insider Inbox. It was uh, a reader named William from Colorado. And I'm I running to the fire here, and, Mike. And I, appre I appreciate him pointing this out. But the reason, and, and what you said is that obviously you see Davis which is where Daniel Whelan went, is it is not a small school because it has 40,000 students, but it's an FCS school. It's not, it's not an FBS. It's not a Power 5 conference, and I appreciate you providing that defense for me. What I need to clarify, though, 
is what actually what actually happened in my brain when I said small school in California. I got, and this is the honest truth, I got the school for Daniel Whelan and long snapper Matt Orzik oh, mixed up. Azusa Pacific. <laughs> because Orzik went to Azusa Pacific, which is a school in California that has, I believe, 10,000 students, and half of those are grad students. It's yeah. only like 5,000 undergraduate students. That's where he played his college football. Yeah. And I got it mixed up <laughs> with Whelan, who also played at a school in California, not a small school, but an FCS school. So I should have just said, if I had had it right, I would have said that Daniel Whelan went to an FCS school not a, and not a Power 5 school. The small school line was actually a mistake on my part because I got his school mixed up with his long snappers yes. with Orzik going to Azusa Pacific. So you- William from Colorado, I appreciate, I appreciate you bringing that line to my attention and I appreciate my colleagues defense and insider inbox of me but I needed to set the record straight right here so hopefully William is listening or watching this show and uh and the clarification has been made I'm glad you did that you're an upstanding citizen you're a man of honor (laughs) I will say this though it had been 21 years now since the last time a player has been drafted out of UC Davis right so they've had 40,000 students a year or whatever the last time was 2002. You're not going to guess, so I might as well just tell no, you. No, I'm not going to be able to he guess. He has ties is. to the Green Bay Packers. Really? Former Packers quarterback J.T. O'Sullivan was the last player to get drafted out of UC Davis. Not by the Packers, by the Saints. Yeah, I was going to say he was but drafted he by New Orleans, but then he ended up in, yep. ended up in Green Bay briefly. Yep. So, but that's the other wow. thing I love about specialists, though. Now, you have Anders Carlson, who, you know, he comes from a kicking family. Him and his brother were, what, the kickers at Auburn for a decade? But I love that. That's what I always love. You know, these specialists, UC Davis, Azusa Pacific, um, Old Dominion, you know, B.R. Hatcher when he was here in camp. Like, yeah. you get these guys that aren't, like, from the big Power 5 schools that get an opportunity. And, and certainly from Wheeland, if you hadn't had a chance to check out the story yet, be sure to do that because he has an incredible story. Yeah, it's And an such a story. little part of it is actually his background from Ireland. I mean, there's just the things that he's done to make his dream come true here. And you obviously you hope for the best for the kid. Yeah, well, one of many young players that will take the field for the Packers at Soldier Field in week one. On our next show, we'll get to the keys to victory and break things down a little bit more with another look at this Packers-Bears matchup. But for now, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team throughout week one. We will have it all for you on Packers.com. For Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next time.